Do the trashy pulp novels of the world have anything to offer? Our bestseller is all they're cracked up to be. Here at Terrible Book Club, we explore whether you really can judge a book by its cover or its ridiculous synopsis. You ever passed a book and thought, ugh, who's reading this? We probably are. Welcome to episode 53 of the Terrible Book Club. I'm Paris, and this is Chris. Hello. This time we read Mazeppa the Wolfhound by Raymond N. Domkowitz. If this is your first time listening to the show, what we do here at Terrible Book Club is read books that we assume will be bad, and this is based on either their cover or title summary or some combination of, uh, of those things. So we force ourselves to read books that we would never otherwise choose to pick up. Uh, usually this results in a hilariously disappointing read. Once in a while, though, a book comes along that's pretty good, or at least sort of subverts our assumptions. Um, today, though, I, I don't think that happened. <laughs> nope. Um, once again, we were disappointed. I was disappointed in many ways by this book. Yeah. Um, before, before we get into it too much, though, um, I'd just like to thank the person who recommended this book. So thank you, uh, to my friend, Lisa, who recommended this book to us, I don't know, a year ago, two years ago, something crazy like that. It's been a long time. Uh, so at least thank you for your patience. Uh, she used to work in publishing and has found other wonderful nonsense for us, namely one of our lost books. Uh, we had an episode about a book called When an Elf Appears <laughs> that, yeah, uh, that was like Elisa the, the had found for us. So Altered Beast Tiger Sex book or something. Yeah, it was uh it was t- lion no, it was lion sex. It was and lions also- and tigers. And I bears? Think. No, I know bears this time around. You think maybe in the No, it was like it was like a lion and a dog. I don't know. Anyway, it was like weird fucking animal sex. Um that's I guess we're not talking about that today, weirdly. Um Well, <laughs> So this week, so for the content warnings this week are pretty minor. Uh, we will be discussing some mild violence, race and racism, and one particular scene involving nursing an infant that is very bizarre. It's probably not what you think, but it's weird, so I'm just warning you about it. Uh, this book is also all about dogs, so if you've got a dog phobia, uh, this one is not I, for you. I have an issue with that statement, Paris. Yeah, okay, it's not all <laughs> it's about... Not... We'll, we'll, it's, 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 yeah. Hang yeah. on, hang on. All right. Uh, this is the book summary for Mazeppa the Wolfhound. Mazeppa the Wolfhound is a story about the origins of Salukis, one of the oldest breeds of dogs. It takes place in ancient times, about 7,500 years ago, and in modern times, circa the 1920s in the south of the United States. It also tells of Mazeppa's noble passage from the earth to the starlights beyond all human knowledge and dreams the Rainbow Bridge, and Saluki Heaven. But it is not a typical story about Salukis. It is about immortality, the perfection of being, family, and good and evil. It is about the Saluki as a role model for unconditional love and how our dogs affect our lives. There are bits and pieces of many genres. Fantasy, history, Christians and pagans, southern U.S. culture, race relations, and care of the sick, elderly, and disabled. But remember, it is fiction. It is fantasy. <laughs> I have so many problems with just the summary. I can't. The summary is can't. not accurate. It's, no, it's inc- it's kind of accurate, but it's not really accurate. No, uh, so th- it is accurate in that it tells you this book focuses largely on Saluki. So if if you are not a dog person or you've never heard of that dog, um, imagine. A greyhound with long ears and long hair, kind of. They're, they're very fast. They have a similar um, uh, sight hound body. So a sight hound is like a, a slim, sort of tall dog uh, that can run very fast and they hunt by sight. 
uh, my mom was like an amateur dog breeder and i had dogs as a kid so i i have all this like fucking dumb dog knowledge that i guess is coming in handy today great thanks um but usually i doesn't matter um anyway salukis yes they are one of the technically oldest breeds of dogs they were um very popular in you know sumer egypt other areas in mesopotamia and the fertile crescent um again very similar to uh other sight hounds like greyhounds, pharaoh hounds, uh, bo- uh, borzois. I don't know. There's like a whole host of dogs that are pretty similar. There's a lot of dog breeds I don't even know about, and I like dogs a lot. That's what I'm saying. When I was a kid, my mom was really into dogs, and she was an amateur dog breeder, and I know way too much about dogs. Um, oh, so that being said, I'm not like I'm not like a dog freak now, but man, th- this author Paris, is dog freak. <laughs> That's what, your, your mind freak. Ray Domkowitz, dog freak, dog freak. <laughs> oh boy, we're gonna take this ancient dog and make it immortal. <laughs> um, yeah. So, actually, I don't even know. Should we? I kind of want to get into the authorship before we get into anything else yeah, about the book. So, like another dog so, book. Yeah, I was gonna say this sounds familiar, Chris. You want to tell the people uh, why? It, there's like a double layer authorship, like author within an author slash. I don't know if this this person was made up or not. Oh, because apparently Mr. Domkovitz is relaying the story from some. I forgot his first name. It's like something. His nickname is Runt, and oh. then his last name is Make Peace. Yeah, yeah. As his... in the words "Make and Peace" put together, which makes me feel like it's super fake. No, no, no. It's real. Um. Yeah, so the guy who's listed as the author, Raymond Domkovitz, he kind of uh, reorganized and rewrote the notes of a guy named Michael Runt Makepeace, Brigadier General Michael Runt Makepeace, U.S. Army retired, uh, he reminds us. So, oh, and it gets weirder. So at first you're like, okay, this is just like um, a, a man, a dog and his cop or badge or whatever the fuck that book was called that we read. <laughs> yeah, the dog hell? cop book about... yeah, the, it was like a man his dog oh my god i said a man his dog You're and his cop that a second right. ago it was... getting... it's the one with the hot nanner part in it yeah yeah that? yeah it was a few episodes ago um we read this book where it was about this guy's life and he was he was a, a canine officer and he was really into his dog and the guy listed as the author wasn't actually the guy who the story was about was just his friend who did it for him and this is exactly the same thing it's so bizarre like both dog guys both like military or law enforcement dudes who just like hand their memoirs to someone else to deal with i guess like do law enforcement dog people also want to write a lot but don't actually want to do it for some reason like what's stopping them i don't yeah that's that's my question like maybe they just didn't feel like they had enough expertise to do it so they wanted someone else to do it but like i said it gets weirder so if you read the footnotes at the end you find out that so not only do we have like the actual ghost author and then this guy who kind of edited it and maybe embellished a little bit this was also copy edited by somebody which is surprising uh, the copy editor is listed as Sharon Mariah Steele, PhD, which sounds yeah, like a Bond villain. These are villain. all super uh, fake names, though. Yeah, no, they're real. Uh, sh- I looked Sharon up. She's real. Uh, she is a dog breeder. Uh, Raymond Domkovitz is a CPA in Maryland, I guess. Um, and uh, Runt Make Peace is dead. Oh, um, oh. well, he's not then, making no peace no more. Oh, here, here, it gets better. And then there's a further note that says that it's from Abigail Rebecca Makepeace Chaffee or Chafee. This is Michael Runt Makepeace's daughter, who apparently took her dad's notes when he died, added to them, and interviewed people. And how, so she. How many the layers one... in are we now, Paris? <laughs> like God. this is like the third or fourth layer in. Yeah. So there are four distinct humans that are responsible for this work, which is, like, all the more embarrassing for how, like, not great it is. I mean, you had four whole people involved, and it's still not good. (laughs) Maybe it gets better later, because we should also uh, let everyone know that this is technically a three-part series. 
I guess, but we read the first part. Yeah, Because so, that was long enough. Right, right. So what happened was, you know, Elisa told me about this book. I put it on a list and then, you know, put everything on Goodreads a little while ago. And it had um, Mazeppa the Wolfhound part one, part two, and part three as three separate books. So we were like, okay, obviously we're only going to read one of these and we'll read the first one. Um, but then we buy it and we discover that it's actually just one book. But because it was separated out into three, we just read the first part because, as Chris pointed out, the part one was 200 pages. Um, each part is 200 pages, so it would have been 600 pages. Um, I actually read halfway through the second book, and let me just say, it would take us a whole week to talk about all the problems in that second section because it takes place uh, in the 1920s in the South, and there's a whole lot of... Uh, I got 10 pages into it before I put yeah. it down because uh, I'll just be up front and say that, it, okay, there's a lot of ex-slave characters, I yep. believe, mm -hmm. in there. Yep. And they all talk like how racist cartoons of black people talk. Yep. You know those? Yep. It's that. It's a whole lot of that. Yeah, and also I don't understand how there could be that many ex-slaves around because it was 1920-something, and I did the math, and, like, even if you were born, you know, at the towards the tail end of when the Emancipation Proclamation was, like, enforced everywhere, I mean, you still would have been... <coughs> excuse me. You still would have been, like, 77 by the time the book happens, so I don't know. Anyway, we're not gonna we're not gonna get further into that, but um We're not gonna talk about that part no. anyway, because there was enough Ugh. craziness happening in the first book. Yeah. Uh, uh, that focused on one woman, pretty much. Yeah. Uh, her name is Luki, like the end of Saluki. Which also yeah. sounds like a fake there's a lot of fake sounding names that happen in this book. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um yeah, so the whole first book that we read um, you know, it's called Mazeppa the Wolfhound Part 1, but, uh, you don't meet Mazeppa in Part 1. Mazeppa nope. doesn't happen until halfway through Part 2, so I know that's the title, but doesn't have anything Sadly, to do with Sadly, we're not one. meeting Mazeppa in this podcast, no. guys, so, you know, uh, <laughs> abandon that dream. I'm sure you were all excited. But... Yes. Uh, so, we have Luki Galanzu, which apparently means the wise woman according to a sumerian dictionary by some university i forget i don't know it's some like rudimentary sumerian dictionary that uh i think phil i don't know some university in philly maybe put up or something um so the author like went on there and was like typed in like wise woman and then like slammed the words together but it's not really how language works, so I don't know. Uh, I don't know what he was thinking there. Uh, he spends a lot of time telling us about uh, ancient Sumer, um, Egypt. We end up in Tarsus and Rome, uh, all over. You're the skipping place. ahead past a whole lot of sections <laughs> here because, as you may, as you may, as people may have noted right there, that's a lot of different time periods yeah. happening right there. So. Let's maybe talk about why Luki could be in all those times. Yeah, yeah. So um, the book opens with Miss Luki Galanzu, which, as I'm saying, just sounds stupid. Uh, yep. <laughs> yes. And she is a wet nurse to the leader of some ancient Sumerian city. I don't remember the name of it. Um, Kengir? Kengir, yeah. She is the wet nurse to the king of Kengir, I believe. Um so, she, but she's from Eridu, maybe? I don't remember. She's from a different town, uh, but she's the wet nurse, and she's, like, in love with Alum, Alulim, who I think is the king, right? Or, yes, yeah. yeah, he's the king. She's in love with the king, uh, but nothing ever comes of that. Uh, she just kind of loves him from afar. She seems to believe that he loves her, too, but fucking, I don't fucking think so, lady. I'm pretty sure that you have no evidence to support that, so... Anyway, um, one day, she's out taking a stroll. No, she one day a, she's, out, she's out having her period by the river. Oh, yeah, no, because... it's very important that the, the author makes it makes sure that you know that she's out having her period by the river or whatever. I, I was, while that's happening. Ugh, anyway, she goes, yeah, she she's 
sit, taking a break from breastfeeding babies because that is literally her job as a wet nurse. And she's sitting by a tree and she's like, oh no, the the bleeding is happening or whatever. <laughs> well, I don't. Apart. I she, she don't. Like fell asleep or something yeah, and then I, woke up and she's like, oh, it happened. I don't know why this is in the story. Honestly, it bothered me. Uh, anyway, she's like, well, gotta go deal with this by the river. So she walks down to the river and she hears uh, a little dog crying. And she goes to rescue it and she finds a puppy uh, sucking on the nipples of its dead mom because its mom had died like uh was killed by hunters and the dog was sucking the nipples so hard that it had actually started to eat the flesh of its dead mom you know i might <laughs> we might want to put some new content warnings in the beginning of this episode. it's fine um, it's fine um so it's like really sad she's like oh and you know she's like i want to save this puppy so you know you know chris what do you what do you do as a as a woman who wants to save a puppy you let it suck on your boobs? Because that's the same thing. So, it's insinuated that Luki breastfeeds dogs? It's not insinuated. It is directly stated that she picks up the puppy, puts it under her robes, and lets it suckle on her breast, her human breast. A puppy is breastfeeding on a human, and as far as I know, that is not a thing. I mean, I, don't, there's I guess probably you could... a problem that would happen there, right? Like, yeah, I mean, I get, I guess like you could try it, but I feel like the dog would get sick, right? Like, I mean, we can drink cow milk, right? So yeah, but cow milk, eh. yeah. I, but it was weird. I anyway. don't want to test like, it. I, you know, no, honestly, no, I, 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 I kind of don't want to know if this works. I mean, I just I read that sentence and I I couldn't stop laughing for so long. I was just it's like this without is... hesitation. It's like, oh, baby needs milk. Well, that I'm a professional milk person and not that kind. Not the kind that I'm straight from the tap over here. Yeah, like I don't <laughs> understand why this is the way that the story was crafted because you very easily could have had her come upon the dog another way and just save it a different way. Like I well, I don't understand. Paris... What, it's probably because that you know what happens next it was probably a punishment for what she was doing uh she immediately gets struck by a bolt of lightning and now her and the dog are immortal yeah that, yep. except yeah except except the dog ages a little bit and then is immortal but like the off screen somewhere because she is frozen she is frozen in time at the age she was at the time of the lightning strike but the dog is not a two-day-old puppy forever? Question mark. We don't know why. You know, Again. the gods were up there just kind of winging it. They just saw some weird <laughs> shit happen. They're like, whoa, lady, what are you... Okay, we got to get rid of this lady. And whoa, they lady, stop breastfeeding the dogs. We can fix this, all right? Just fucking <laughs> yeah. pray by the river. You don't got to breastfeed the dog. <laughs> and then they accidentally threw the immortality lightning bolt instead of the murder lightning bolt. Yes, like, that is what happened. Know. Oh, I love that scene because um, it's described really poorly as a... You know, this, oh, this scary storm, and everyone, everyone's so scared, and they're so scared that they hide underneath the cows. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, that part. What? Which, they had roofs and shit, right? There was a city. Like. Yeah, uh, yeah, like, Sumer, and, like, Ur, um, all, uh, you know, the other, like, Ur, uh, Eridu, all those other, Ken Gear, all those other cities in Sumer, like, we're talking about, like, the one of the seats of civilization like where humanity really blossomed you know these people were yeah these probably people were... one of the first bright ideas was hey we should put a roof over our heads for when it's and, raining yeah and and it was just like crazy that they're describing the storm as though everyone was uh i don't know didn't didn't know what to do it's like yeah like it's just a storm no, dude they've seen lightning the sumerian, before <laughs> those were the sumerian luddites who are like I don't need no fucking roof. What are you people living all soft out here? If it's raining, just hire to the cow. You get free milk from there anyway. Which which just made me think. Uh, which just made me think of if you've ever watched um, Monster Factory Polygon. Uh, thing. Yes, I have many times. Yep, there is an episode where they make. Uh, I think they're playing Dragon's Dogma, and they make this huge like. Um, sort of ogreish lady and they make her son pan pan and there is a part where oh, i remember that one where pan pan 
can climb on the cow and they because of just the way that the environment and objects in the game are formatted like for some reason the game recognizes that a cow is something you can climb on like a spider and so pan pan (laughs) is just like rotating on the cow and that is all i thought about quick get under the cows um and, and his other suggestion is that people sought cover underneath the bellies of the pack animals and they also dug holes to hide in, like, wild animals. And I was like, bro, it would take so long to dig a <laughs> hole big enough for yourself. Like, the and storm would be over. And everything while you're trying to dig, so... <laughs> yeah, I just... What? Um, also, the, the way... We haven't touched upon this yet, but... The writing isn't the worst thing I've ever read, but it's really boring. Um, it seems a little stilted. People don't really talk like people a lot of the time. It's a similar... It's something that we've seen before. Um, it's it's a little better written than some other stuff we've read. Like, it's better than the Dog Cop book. Like, this is a tier sure, up. yeah. This is like a tier yeah. up from Dog Cop book. It's very far up its own butt, though. Oh, yeah. It's yep. so far up its own butt that it, it came out the mouth again and then went back up <laughs> its own butt again. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, we can talk about how the... Uh, I'm just going to say author because... <laughs> Who when knows? We say, okay, when we say author, we're talking about Ray Domkovitz. I If I'm talking about something that um, Michael Makepeace says, I will specify. Because uh, he does make an appearance a couple of times. And he we'll, interjects we'll, a yeah, little bit. Yeah, we'll have to talk about that. Um, but yeah, the, the author is really up his own butt about Saluki's being just the best dog ever, magical, mystical. Um, I'm trying to remember some of the shit that he said. Uh, it was Blood like, of royalty. Oh, the yeah. The seat of civilization. Um, he's like, he's like, they can get all four legs off the ground when they run because they have a double <laughs> suspension gait. And my response to that is, just Google images of dogs running and you will see plenty of other dogs no, that are fake able... Fake news, Paris. That's all fake Photoshop dogs. <laughs> Only Saluki's. <laughs> Can physically get all four paws off the ground. Every other dog has to always be balancing on one paw at least at a time. Yeah, not to mention, like I was saying, there are all these sight hounds that are very similar to Saluki's that honestly, they all look and behave so similarly that I feel like, I mean, they're all, they were all crossbred with each other at one point. I mean, pharaoh hounds are called pharaoh hounds because they were, <laughs> they were also like the Saluki dogs of egyptian royalty and dogs of egypt and it's really weird that this author gets all hung up on salukis and doesn't talk about any of the other types of sight hound like he's acting like this one is literally magical and we will talk about that later um i mean he's like there's no. also a lot more up the buttness about like, like morality and philosophizing about immortality yeah Mm-hmm. That's more of the book than the Saluki stuff. Yeah, the dogs, it's like real heavy on dog stuff up front, like in the forward and at the beginning. And then it's just about this immortal lady and religion. Like they just drop the dog stuff for the most part. Um, the immortal dog like hangs around her and stuff when she gets sad because boy does Luki get sad a lot and for a long time. Yeah, hey, I mean, so uh, when the lightning struck Luki and Nana, um, which that was the was that the dog's original name, Nana? No, it it was like Kien Gear. It's like sounded like the city name, but was spelled with a slightly yeah, different combination of vowels. That's true. That's true. It was it was a different but. Throughout- Kunagir. It was Kunagir. Kunagir, right. And I remember thinking it, it sounded like Kunagal, which is from that other good book that we read. Anyway. Um, so she only calls the dog Kunagir like once. And then the yeah. whole rest of the book, and inexplicably the dog is just called Nana. So when Nana and Luki were hit with a lightning bolt, uh, not only were they granted immortality, they were also granted telepathic communication. Um, just Just between each other. And then, I, well, they, at least for the two of them, right? Yeah. It well, it gets my other issue is <laughs> my other issue with this book is that um, Luki just like sprouts powers randomly throughout the book. Like she just keeps getting more and more powerful and able to do more and more ridiculous shit, even though That's there's what no happens. reason for that. That's what, no, no. There's a reason, Paris. When you get really sad and you stay in a cave for a thousand years, you get a bonus superpower. That's actually how that's that's <laughs> supposed to work. This is like a video game, like she got enough fucking experience points to get new powers. 
Yeah, um, she was just, you know, if you stay in a cave for a thousand years, you get a bonus <laughs> extra, you get another slot to, to pick a skill from. <laughs> That's funny. Um, yeah, I, I mean, so at first, it's just she and Nana have this telepathic connection. And I guess Nana was also given a higher level of sentience when she was hit with the lightning bolt. Because uh, she and uh, Luki have, you know, pretty, I don't know conversations that you can't really just have at a dog right um and um it's a lot of like oh i'm devoted to you you're my favorite companion you're the love of my life yeah Yeah, there's this whole like oh they have this very pure love the dog and the lady but it's not like despite being 200 pages i didn't feel like a whole there was not a whole lot of depth in this story it was like you said it was very much like she lives here for a while, and then, like, once she's like, oh, shit, I guess I'm immortal, I'm not aging, she's like, well, guess I gotta move somewhere else and change my name and, like, pretend I'm someone different. And that just keeps happening over and over again, and, like, Chris was saying, sometimes she gets depressed and goes into a cave for a thousand years, then she comes out and, like, uh, merges into another civilization. And that Literal keeps... thousands of years she yeah. will spend in the cave, and this happens in the space of a paragraph, or perhaps a sentence, it's like, and then Luki was in the cave with Nana for hundreds to thousands of years, being sad about being immortal, which sounds like not the way to deal with being sad about being immortal. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it, again, not that interesting. Um, I'm trying to remember what else really happens other than her just changing her name. I mean, her name is Luki, but she goes by like four other names in the book. I don't care. I It doesn't matter. Also, you learn quickly that she can kind of read other people. She can read other people's thoughts, so can the dog. And. But only like surface thoughts. Only their active surface thoughts, right. She can, they can read thoughts, and then you also find out that she can like cloak herself so that people forget her. So, like, if you can do that. Why you gotta change towns? Why you gotta change your appearance? Yeah, you can that, just that, make okay. people forget you with your will. Like, it, this book doesn't make doesn't have to exist. Later on, there's a part where it acts like she casts a literal, like, D&D spell. Because it's like, and then she casts the Veil of Unseeing. Yes, which is in yes, the Veil and everything. of <laughs> So I was like, is this not, like, a level 3 wizard spell or something? <laughs> yeah, dude. This is just a, this is just D&D. But, like, shitty. I don't under... I would have totally been on board for, like, a mortal dog lady adventure story, but all the adventures that happen are pretty much like, oh, Luki, she was a dog breeder in Egypt for a while, and then she got sad, and then she was a dog breeder slash nurse in Rome for a while, and then she got sad and went away, and then she was a dog breeder slash nurse slash medicine lady in America for a while. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, she just kind of, like, meets some people through history and moves around and breeds dogs sometimes. You know, poor Nana. Nana is a good girl. And what does Nana get, Chris? What happens to Nana throughout this book? She basically will get pimped out whenever Luki's feeling good about herself to make, like, more dogs that she gifts to, like, her friends in her various lifetimes. Yep. Which creates various, like, I guess offshoots of this one Er, dog with the mega ancient womb that gets pimped out across the fucking time. Yeah, scape. yeah. Honestly, sounds like a lot of other crazy, crazy dog people I know who are way more invested in making themselves feel good and having animals to quote unquote care for, but they really just don't do a good job caring for them for example by constantly breeding them to get puppies so they can sell them for money or just to feel like people need them to make puppies i don't know how many times do you think like over okay so this book takes place over the course of seven thousand five hundred years is apparently the length of life that luki and nana have existed for right and how many times like do you think nana's like down for it whenever dude he decides to do this well or like... here's the thing here's the thing like i fucking hope so because they have a mind meld right like right, yes. you would hope that the dog is like hey man i'm uh feeling like i'm ready to make some puppies and lukey's like all right <laughs> sick let's get you let's get you a sire like it's i got been you 500 years since my life. okay all right but like all right we got to talk about this briefly so we are made to believe that lukey is not having any romantic or sexual relationships with anyone for 7,500 years. I call fucking bullshit on that. <laughs> yeah, especially, 
especially when the text constantly references this one time one of her lo- fucking depressions when she went to a cave a bunch of these like these like 50 mystics or whatever like the came magi. to her cave the magi yeah and she keeps them in there for their entire lifetimes and then <laughs> she talks about it um, a bunch more times throughout the book and it's just like oh my favorite times with the magi I think about them often they were my favorites I really like the time I spent with them and I was like yo you were just having orgies with those <laughs> dudes in that cave like you can't no, tell they me they were otherwise. learning she was passing her knowledge on to them oh yeah they learned a lot a <laughs> lot I bet I... They, they, by the way they come out later and they forget about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're like, whoa, how do we get all these scrolls? I don't know. And they're like, how do we get so old? I don't know. Like, everyone's just whatever is everything. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I just don't, like, it's not, a, I know that, so in the first part of the book, you don't know this, but as it goes on, uh, about halfway through or something, you realize that it's about to become a screed about being Christian. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah, because like what basically when Rome hit, okay, she's been in a cave on one of her depression things, and then that's the whole time that Jesus was around, and then she comes out and she starts hearing about this guy, and she wants to know more about him. I was like, why didn't you just make the story so she was out there when Jesus was there? No, no, no. Right? I think no, no, no. She was, but she was in Tarsus. She was studying at a Roman university. Be she was being like no, some... well, Paris. Tarsus is way after Jesus. Wait, really? Yeah. Oh, well, you're the, meets... Okay, you're the one who went to Catholic school for like 15 years, so I'll default This is the part you. where she meets Paul, right? Yeah, Paul saw. Okay, Paul is way the heck after Jesus. Um... He's like hundreds of years later. Oh, that's right. I forgot that that's one of the reasons the Bible is bullshit, is because it's none of it is written like at the place or time that any of it is happening. Yeah, some of the gospel, right. I think the closest one was like supposedly maybe like 50 to 80 years after. But St. Paul is the one responsible for all the, the... Everything after the Gospels is mostly letters from St. Paul of Tarsus, who, by the way, what basically is the shitty parts of the New Testament that people always point to to justify some of their shitty-ass beliefs about oh, other people, really? let's say. Uh-oh. Because think of it this way. Paul, before he was converted to Christian, was Saul. And he was basically a guy that went around uh, persecuting heathenist Jews and murdering them for it. And then all of a sudden he sees a bright light one day and now he's converted to Christianity and basically spends the rest of his life writing letters to people saying how they're heathens and should change their ways. Oh, and th- and this ends up being like one of her friends. Sick. Yeah, right. it, it, that's her buddy later on. But anyway, that... The, she, he gets this beheaded happens... pretty quickly is, is yeah. all I have to say. Like, yeah. he, he's in the book for like a hot second. He gets beheaded and, and hilariously, Lukey is like, Oh no, my friend's about to get beheaded. Too bad. See you later. Yeah, she's like, <laughs> just, like, you know, runs another she... one of those humans just dying in front of me. One of my friends just yeah. has to go. Uh, like, Lukey, can't you save me? I, I noticed you haven't been aging. How do you do that? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck you. Um... But yeah, again, like why? It, why not just have her out of the depression cave when Jesus is there? Wouldn't that be much more interesting than coming out like five hundred years later? Are you afraid that, like, you would have to write into your story that Jesus didn't really do all that stuff? Oh, no. Like, I don't know. What, no, like, I mean, this, I don't know. And then um, after she abandons Paul and lets him be beheaded, <laughs> at, Paul and a bunch of other people, she le- like she knows there's going to be, like, a a Jewish and Christian genocide, basically, and is just like, oh, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Peace. Like, and, yeah, like, doesn't it. save anyone except for her two servants, right? Oh, like, yeah, her two handmaidens yeah. that, like, die horribly later anyway. <laughs> Yeah, all because of her bullshit. Because, she, because like, her two handmaidens, or one of them dies because Luki is like, okay, time for me to split. I'm, like, getting too old to be not aging anymore. So, like, gotta get out of here with my servants. But again, we've already established that this is unnecessary since she can, like, cloak herself and make people forget her. But anyway, she's still gonna create a miraculous diversion. So sometimes uh, she just... What does she usually do? I, I feel like most of the time she just leaves and disappears. She literally just walks away. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this time she's like, no, no, no. I'm going to fake my death. Sick. All right. All right. I'm going to. So she sets up like this like rude Goldberg machine to start a fire in her house. Yeah. And like <laughs> leave a corpse or something. It's like, where'd yeah. you get the fucking she corpse? She stole a corpse. <laughs> she stole a corpse uh, to stand in for her body. Sets up this like crazy, I don't know, crazy chain of events to 
uh, set a fire in her house, and she tells one servant, like, all right, just leave and meet me at the meeting point. At this meeting point, I'll explain later. And that servant is like, all right, I, I, Captain, you got it. And, like, she leaves, no problem. The other one, though, was, like, out fucking her boyfriend and got stuck in the fire and burned to death. Yes. <laughs> I, just, I, what? And and also, these people are literally just names on a page. There's no character Yeah, that development. character was in the... It was, she was in the book for, like, maybe 15, 20 pages, and then she just burns to death for <laughs> daring to fuck her boyfriend yeah. while just, Rome was burning or something. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, was this Tarsus? Or was I, it somewhere I, else? I, you know what? I don't it, remember. Uh, much like Luki, it all blurs together. I can't all these names and faces over thousands of years. Yep. And then uh, after that, uh, I don't know, she ends up in... I don't know, she meets... Brendan the Navigator, who is an Irish saint, he's in there for a second. Oh, no, wait, I forgot. No, next, after this, there's like a, a fade to black, and then we the sun comes up uh, 2,000 years later or something, and she's friends with Augustine. Oh, who yeah. You might know more about <laughs> than I do. Uh, yeah, St. Augustine, very famous Christian like priest philosopher. Uh, who apparently did a lot lives of- on his own island. Yeah, he did. That I'm pretty sure that that's true. I I wasn't paying attention much much in this part of the theology history course, but you know, very well regarded as one of the preeminent writers of Christian morality slash theology ever. Period. End of story. Mm. And of course, Luki was a good buddy to him, so that they could go on for forty or fifty pages about why does does God exist and does he love you? Mm. And then it really starts reading like the later New Testament b- part of the Bible. Like, so closely that I'm pretty sure that most of the authorship of this book was like, how close can I make this sound like a scripture? Oh, boy. I mean, yeah, and I I remember during the Augustine part when she's on his island, it it opens on, like, a brand new chapter, and the first line is something like, and then Luki was on the boat going to visit her very best friend Augustine, and I was like, (laughs) <laughs> what like it just doesn't establish any of this it just boop drops you there with like no context and i was like what the fuck and then they i don't know she's like on the island with him and then he's so special to her that she finds nana a, a good dog dad and they have some dog sex and they produce a <laughs> little man was that his name? Yeah, little, little Man. Little, <laughs> Augustine's dog, Little Man. Little Man. You know, that Saluki that Augustine had definitely really in history. Um, And, like, there are points where I'm like, oh, man, like, Luki's gonna, she's gonna finally get some. She's gonna go <laughs> down with Augustine because there's this moment 3, where she... 3,000 years of virgin and yeah, finally... Yeah, where she, she lays down on his lap and... Nothing happens. I'm like, lady, you gotta get laid. You're <laughs> Paris, is so this the first old. time? Is, is this the first time you've been begging for a romance plot in a book? <laughs> well, I'm begging for some realism here because it's not realistic to have a human alive for thousands of years not fucking anything else. I just. <laughs> There's but totally no... down with pimping out her immortal dog companion as many times as she Yeah, like, it would be one thing if they established that she was asexual or something. But it says right at the beginning that she had a husband, but he, like, died or something, and her kids died too somehow. And then, when she was employed by Alulim, she fell in love with Alulim, but he was a king, and nothing ever happened with that. And now it's thousands of years later, and there's just been nothing in this lady's life the whole time. Like, I just don't buy it. It's I forgot realistic. about her husband and kids for so much, because later on, she because talks about, like... Because it's, like, half a second. No, but later on, when she talks about, like, oh, I could finally die, maybe, and, and meet Alulim and Yoser up in, he- in Saluki Heaven or something. So she completely forgets about her husband and kids, I guess. Oh, yeah, Even fuck though that she's shit. been loyal to them... For thousands of years. <laughs> yeah, fuck that. She's, she was in love with that king. She's getting that king dick in the afterlife, Chris. <laughs> that has been her end goal. Um, but she won't actually, you know, she'll just wait for it to happen naturally. She's she's not going to cheat to get the king dick. No, and I, I just think it's funny that in the, there's like one passage where she talks about how she loves Alulim. And she's like, you know, he never said anything to me, but I could just, I could just tell by the way that he like never took me to his bed and how he looked at me. And I was like... 
Those sound like the opposite of... Yeah, you know, <laughs> there's literally a line where you mention like, oh, he could take anyone he wanted because he's the king and that's how it works, but he never did it to me. I, I get what she's saying. She's like, oh, he respected me too much to, you know, to put me in his harem, but like... Lady, you're really just guessing. Like, you have, there is no <laughs> concrete evidence that this dude you have pledged yourself to for thousands of years even likes you like that. Like, <laughs> this is not a good idea. That poor first husband, though. That oh, poor I first know. husband's been waiting in dude, like, a we world, whatever afterlife name. there is. Do we even know his name? No, oh, never. First husband, R.I.P. R.I.P. First husband. <laughs> He's still up there in heaven like 7,000 years later just going like, yep, only me. Just It's always only been me. <laughs> he's just so pissed. He's, he's like in heaven watching heaven TV, like watching Earth TV. And he's just watching her do all the shit. And he's like, that fucking bitch. Oh, oh you're in the this. depression cave again. Oh, dude, this is so boring. You're just sitting there like eating random plants with the dog. Oh. It was one time you had all the dudes in there with you. That was fun, but <laughs> yeah, he's like, he's like, come on, more orgies. What am I paying for here? Jeez. Um, yeah, the I, ultimate I... afterlife cuckold porn. <laughs> <laughs> oh god. Ugh. Yeah, I gotta, I gotta. We're gonna have to slice in some uh, new content warnings at the beginning of this episode. <laughs> now, I, you know, I think people know by now. If we're talking about the content warnings of the book, our own content warnings. That's. You're rolling the dice there. <laughs> That's very true. Barnyard language all the time. 24-7. Uh -huh. always, always in effect. Oh my god. I just looked at my notes. What'd you see? <laughs> Was it Saluki Heaven, Paris? Because that's what I wanted to talk about. No, it's... It's Teppy. Oh, Teppy. Yeah. <laughs> How can we forget about Teppy? Hey, everyone. Do you know who Teppy might be? Just think back to history. Who what could... famous thing? Oh, why? Who it, it's the, the vizier to the pharaoh, Imhotep. <laughs> the pharaoh so... Yozer is like, yo, Teppy, what's up? <laughs> I mean, that fucking killed me. I it did. I was... He's oh. literally like, oh, Teppy, you're always tepping it up <laughs> Teppy, my man! Like, I don't think that... Imhotep... Bury me with none of my gold. Give it all to... Like, to Luki. I mean, is there some evidence out there that Imhotep was Teppy to his friend? I don't think so. I, I don't even know if that's how that name was pronounced in ancient Egyptian. Probably not. Ugh. I While we're on stupid stuff, I want to mention that Saluki Heaven is mentioned as a definite concept in this book and there's yes. like a rainbow bridge to it or something so, which sounds like isn't that asgard like yeah i mean I've, I've i've seen a lot of people with dogs and cats and stuff talk about when their animals die like going over the rainbow bridge and yeah all i think of is norse mythology but i guess it's like a different thing uh there was some note in the book saying that it was some, like, anonymous story that someone wrote about a dog dying and going over a rainbow bridge. And I was like, I think you people are just stealing from Norse mythology and not realizing it. I mean, there's also... I Another thing I found out about was, I guess, rainbow babies are a thing. And I guess that's what some people were, like, called miscarriages. And I was like, I don't understand Ugh. any of this. So. All right. Rainbow I was just also curious bridge. if Saluki Heaven was completely separate from the rest of Dog Heaven. Yeah, you see, well, when you're going into Heaven, there's like this little doggy door, and that's Saluki <laughs> Heaven. It's in the, in the lower right. Uh, I guess, I guess, fuck every other dog, right? Like only is, is Saluki there a Heaven. There's separate Dachshund Heaven with all winter dogs. No, fuck you. Your dog isn't graceful and made for the pharaohs, Chris. <laughs> oh, sorry. What about like all Pug Heaven or like all? English terrier heaven that's just really loud and snorty all No, all it's time. only Saluki's because Saluki's are the most perfect dog <laughs> created by nature and untouched by humans. Things that this man actually Except says that one book. time where the uh, progenitor of all uh, Saluki's sucked a lady's boob. Yeah, also, right? except for all of the time. Like, at the beginning of the book, he, he says, like... You know, I really hope humans don't ruin the breed. And I'm like, dude, humans have been curating the breed since its inception. I mean, that's how you get a a breed is because humans <laughs> just force the, the do same dogs to interbreed. And like, I, I, in, uh, he, the author has this 
issue where he's like, Salukis are created by nature and they're perfect. And like, I I don't know. He doesn't really seem to understand that humans are directly involved in their breeding, even, even in his own book. Because Luki is a dog breeder at, in many, many, like, iterations of her immortal life. She's a dog breeder of Salukis, so, like... Across the Millennium Dog Pit. I, I, yeah, she really is. Um, yeah, it does... Ugh, anyway. <laughs> I just found another note that I came across. At one point, if the, the Nana and Luki are looking at each other, and this is the phrase that he decided to use, she looked toward Mother and smiled. Doggy style. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. And then actually, we're kind of we're kind of flopping back and forth in time here. But whatever. Fuck this book. I don't care. We're, we're, um, we're, we've become unstuck in time. Like yeah. Billy I, Pilgrim. Yep. Um. So back in Egypt, you know, with Tepi, Tepi and Repi, the dynamic duo. <laughs> I forget who Repi was, but Repi and Tepi was. No, the same. that's Luki's name in Egypt is like Repeshnet. Oh, or fuck, Rep- fuck, fuck, Repeshnet or whatever. Yeah, you're right. Um. And then they they're talking about how she's she's this uh yeah she she became like Rapeshnet, the the Egyptian dog breeder to the Pharaoh Djoser. and they're talking about how like some of the dogs that she bred for the Pharaoh had like these titles like one one of the dogs was Baron the Wise and the other one was Dolmi the Far Sighted and I was like do dogs really need fucking titles like this <laughs> like is that a thing. <laughs> Um, Must have been good boys and girls. Well, yeah, well, apparently, well, you see, Joser loved them so much, he allowed them to judge, uh, to make political decisions for him. Uh, Oh, yeah, yeah, that's the whole time. I I made a note. Like, there was this, I don't know, some shit went down, and he basically had the dogs. He was about to die. He was about to die, and he was, like, going to divide up his possessions. Yeah, and he was like, all right, whichever dude the dogs like more is who gets, like, all of my shit. And my note was, oh boy, trusting political decisions in your estate management to dogs seems like a real terrible idea, especially yeah, for if, a Yeah, because if the dog snapped at the people, he yeah. would uh, kill them. He, he would them murder killed. them. Yeah, they would be put to death. What? I There was a couple parts where, he, like, the, the pharaoh was talking about, like, you know, giving slaves their justice and stuff, and I just kept thinking about like a, a Nile song getting louder and louder. I was gonna louder. say I left Wicked Hard all your. So there, it, for those of you who aren't into heavy metal, there is a very famous, popular heavy metal band called Nile, and all of their songs are about ancient Egyptian shit. And um, <laughs> usually some form of ancient Egyptian torture. Whenever there's an especially like Egyptian ass line, Chris <laughs> had notes that was like Nile intensifies, Nile at full volume. Like yeah. there's one that says to the pretenders who falsely claim their obedience to the gods of Egypt and Pharaoh, I command thee. <laughs> and it was like Nile that's at... straight up a Nile line. <laughs> I know. Like I, oh, I was really glad that you left those because it was oh, um, these last captured, chained, and dragged back to be judged by Pharaoh. <laughs> Come on, no. sick lyrics, bro. Black seeds of vengeance. Um, Fucking lash to the slave stick over here. Oh, yeah. Ooh, black dogs of vengeance. Yeah. yeah. There you go. <laughs> black dogs of vengeance. Okay. Paris, do I you want to talk about like the real twist behind this book now? Like when we get jump back into the. Runt's point of view, shall we say? Oh God! I mean, there's so many fucking things in this book. Like this, it's one of these. It's one of the books. It's one of those books where there are so many tiny little things that are fucked up that we're not going to reach all of them. So you know what? But Go yeah, ahead. There's the the thing that like kind of blew the lid off this whole thing for me, and that made me like, oh wait, what the fuck? So apparently, uh, Runt, Michael Runt, make peace, Brigadier General, yada yada, or what have you, Mother of Dragons, Break of Chains. Yeah, right, uh, right. He, he had all, th- these are all stories relayed to him by his mother and father. And where did they get it? Why, from Luki. So, yeah, there's some yeah, lady. Yeah, yeah, everyone, everyone think about that for a second. There is some lady that talked to this dude's parents and claimed to be an immortal woman dog breeder from Sumer. And then those parents believed it and told Michael about that. And that's why he really likes Salukis. Um, yeah. So everyone think about this for a moment. Remember at the top. Someone's running a scam here, right? Yeah. Remember at the top of the show when I was like, the summary has a lot of things wrong with it, and one of those things is that it says it's, like, a fiction and a fantasy. No. 
this fucking dude like make peace and his daughter and I maybe also the guy who is the author they all really believe that this shit is real and happened like there apparently are notes and interviews because the daughter did a bunch of interviews with people after her dad died and yet apparently Michael Makepeace's parents Rebecca and Jonathan Makepeace knew Lukey and Lukey is the one that gave them their puppy Mazeppa the title dog <clears throat> and uh, yeah I um I actually did read half the second book like I said and I did read um the scene where they meet Lukey and get Mazeppa and I mean unless she comes back later like they're in her house for an hour or two <laughs> so I don't know where I don't I don't understand how there's this like weird family secret about an immortal dog breeding lady and immortal dogs if they were only in the lady's house for two hours like i but I... but like th there has to be some kind of weird scam happening here because to me listen the last name make peace sounds like a last name you'd get if you were a member of a cult of some kind <laughs> yeah and an yeah, immortal it's, it's dog a, a lady who name. claims to be from seven thousand years ago sounds like a cult leader to me so, I, I don't, you know, I don't have much to go by here, besides from my gut, but I feel like maybe this dude's parents were involved in some kind of weird hippie cult commune thing that was revolved around Salukis and this one lady, maybe, claiming no, to be I mean, immortal? I mean, it seems like that, but from what I read of the... And again, you don't get any of this in the first book. Um, in the second book, nah, I mean, it didn't seem like that at all. I, I don't, I don't understand, like, a way, you know what would have been way more interesting? If we just had all of the crazy scribbled notes and interviews and it would have been like House of Leaves where we had to, like, piece together this fucking crazy-ass yeah, that, mystery. That like, would be way cool. That would have been way better than someone taking all that stuff, sanitizing it, and adding more, because basically what happened was, I think from what I can garner, is that Michael Makepeace um, heard all these stories from his parents, wrote them all down. Um, he died. His daughter kind of carried on, interviewed people, made more notes. They gave it to uh, Ray here. And Ray added the whole first part of the book to flesh out presumably Lukey's backstory. So, like, I think that the parents met Lukey, thought she was like, a cool lady and then it somehow turned into no 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 she's really immortal <laughs> and like also well i mean she was wearing white robes and she let the dog suck on her, her boob personally so seems like a cool lady to me well that's the thing i don't think that that was in the notes i think that that was just <laughs> improvised um because there's even part of the book that says like you know i had to make the first part I had to really fill in a lot of stuff in the first part, so it's a lot less oh, detailed. Oh, you didn't have a fucking primary source, Ray? From fucking <laughs> yeah. Sumer? Well, at the beginning, he says that he has Sumerian friends, which I thought was bizarre, uh, because Sumer hasn't been a country for a really long time. <laughs> Is he, like, trying to say, like, he has some, like, Middle Eastern friends? I in a guess. Really shitty way? I think he's trying to say that he has friends that trace their ancestry back to Sumer, but like, how do you I really know? Don't know. Well, you see, my great grandpappy Teppy, <laughs> way back in the <laughs> you see, he had this best friend Reppy, Reppy and Teppy. They go all around all they do all their chariot racing and their dog breeding together. Oh, they were the best. You sometimes they would race dog breed. Yeah, you can, <laughs> you can even see them on the tombs together. See, that's Reppy. That anyway, yeah, this, this guy is the fucking author is so obsessed with talking about how man you can see Salukis in the tombs. Like they were they were mummified with the pharaohs. And they were carved on the tomb walls. Like, dude, a lot of animals were cats were mummified. Other types of dogs were mummified. Like, there are plenty of animals. Like crocodiles are shown on tomb wall. Like, I. He just doesn't... He just How wants... dare you disrespect the immortal Ur-alligator that gave birth Ugh. to all other alligators? Yeah, seriously. It, um... Actually, all alligators are immortal. Did you know that? Because, you know, they're from that time anyway, right? So... Ugh. Yeah, I mean, this, this book also has some weird race stuff going on. Um, it's definitely a lot worse in book two, but in book one here, there's some 
there's some stuff here and there that make me go, yep, wish that. Like how the Native Americans are treated? <laughs> oh, yeah, how... Well, it's weird, right? Because Luki is from Sumer. She's not... <sighs> she shouldn't be a white savior, but she is treated that way. They, it, he specifically says that she has lighter skin and, like, dark eyes and hair, but lighter skin, and that she has to specifically darken her skin. She basically has to do blackface to fit in with the natives in America, which is another just, like, fucking stupid, ridiculous thing that doesn't need to happen. Like, And all the Native American characters have, like, really shitty, like, tribe names like Big Tree <sighs> and Laughing Man. And Red Cherry, the lady that puts paint on her lips. Yeah, I mean, like, the the Lenape are a legitimate native group. Uh, they are also known as the Delaware, um, you know. So from about Delaware north, uh, you know, northeastern uh, native people. I mean, they, you know, they're real. I, I don't, those names also did come off to me as being kind of stereotypical, um, and there were also some moments where the natives were supposedly singing or chanting, and it that stuff is not Lenape. <laughs> yeah, you know, like, like remember uh, how I uh, said before, uh, like how hey, a oh. race, yeah, yeah, like, like how a racist you. black people cartoon sounds. This was like how a racist against Native American people cartoon sounds. Yeah, like that, have you ever seen Peter Pan? Yeah, yeah, that, that pretty much. That's how it felt. Um, and she, like, that's right, I mentioned earlier how Luki, at first, is just immortal and can, is mentally connected with the dog, and then it's like, oh, me and the dog can read people's surface thoughts, and then it becomes, oh, I can cloak myself so people will have to forget me, and then it becomes, oh, I can talk to all animals, and then it's like, oh, I can create mirages, oh, just kidding, I can create whole different environments from what's around me to the point where I can create a whole world of summer during the winter on a mountain, and I can create, it's like, she just keeps getting these powers, and there's just no rhyme or reason to it, and I don't know, I think it is to reward her for taking steps towards Christianity and sainthood, which is kind of what it seems like this book is going for. Um, Because she she gets, like, real powerful when she's very Christian. Yeah, the more Christian she gets and the more she's like, there's only one God, the more power she ends up having. Yeah, which is another, like, weird undertone. But yeah, it's, it's at the point, like, by the time she's in America, like, first of all, she, I don't know, she, like, for like a hot second meets up with Brendan the 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 navigator he's a saint catholic saint is an irish saint and she meets up with him and then like I, but i don't even know why because brendan didn't come to uh, the americas so like i don't understand it was like she says like hey sup brendan you're going to get on a ship she's like cool me too and then she just goes to um the United, you know, what later becomes America and the United States. And she just stalks the native people for, like, question mark, hundreds of years. And she learns their language and, like I said, you know, basically does blackface uh, to look like them. Like, it says that she has to darken her skin, uh, which is just, uh, yeah, I don't know. This is just a very poorly thought out endeavor. I Why were we talking, we forgot to mention one thing about why she decided, like, oh, Christianity is the right way. It seemed to hinge on the fact that, oh, this is the only god I've ever heard of that sent himself down to be sacrificed for his people, which is not true. Uh, yeah, hey, I'll, yeah, like, have you ever heard of Odin? Have you ever heard of maybe, I don't know, thousands of other gods who have sacrificed themselves for the good of humanity? It's not. Yeah, that's not just him. In fact, a lot of the Jesus story was compiled from many different various pagan ideas and other sources. Yeah, uh, what was that? What was that? Was it Mithras? Was Mithras the cult of Mithras? Yeah. The thing that was like right before Jesus sort of overlapped and they kind of yep, took that, a bunch of shit from that. It was Mithras. Yeah. I mean, and and so, and then, so it's that piece of information. So she, despite living for thousands of years and having experienced tons of religions in the Middle East, uh, you know, Europe and America, she doesn't. Like, if anyone would have the appropriate background to know that that is not true, it would be her, and yet she yeah, still doesn't right? know. And uh, the other the other thing that convinces her is she's talking to 
is it Paul or Augustine? And they're like, oh, yo, you're so Christian. You got a cross burn on your head. And she's oh, like, yeah. what? Yeah. So she had like this weird fit one night in front of a campfire and the, you know, a, a, like Ember came out and hit her on the head and she has this, you know, little cross burn in her cross shaped burn in her head from that. And, uh, <laughs> they're like, oh, that's totally a sign. And she's like, oh man, you're right. It must be. <laughs> I, I just don't, I, I could just. You're 4,000 years old and you're getting taken in by like the specious of our, arg- most specious of arguments. Yeah. There's like, I don't know, there's a ton of other shit in this book that makes no sense. Like, during one of her uh, cave depressions, she has her friends, question mark, servants, question mark, people in the town, I don't know, dismantle the ship that they sailed in and carry it up into the cave on top of a mountain, piece by piece, reassemble it, and then live inside of it. I That's was something unclear that happens. if they, they made a ship again or if they just made a different structure with the ship. No, no, no. It would be funny if they just made the ship again they but did. in a cave to live they, in. They did. Because that this is... one lady was like, you couldn't just get the other trees from around the mountain? That is exactly what they did. They they rebuilt the ship inside the cave and lived inside of it. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Sure. Um, and then whenever she is in her like cave depressions or whenever she's living in like her magical environment she always has an army of dogs and wolves and sometimes they are all wearing necklaces and silk coats <laughs> you know just but then she doesn't really ever use them they're just like around to seem intimidating to like whatever group of people stumbles upon her depression cave well and, and then she's actually like no nah, i won't hurt you but i still have a lot of wolves well and my question is like where are all these wolves and saluki's coming from is she just constantly breeding dogs and wolves i guess she must be there's not, nothing much else to do when you're in your cave depression, I guess. But she no, she like does it like after she's depressed. She'll be like depressed for 500 years, and then Donna's like, "Hey, can you cut it out? I I really, you know, it's been a while." And then she's like, oh, "All right, let's go out and get you some boyfriends." I, that seems to be the cycle that she lives in for 7,500 years. Yeah, they they also make a claim that um, somehow she gave humanity astronomy. I don't, well, no, she, like, copies, pl- oh, it's when they, she was with the magi, magi or something, right? They, like, study the stars and make plates or something? Yeah, but she was, like, the keeper of the plates and gave it to people and had them disseminate it, so it was, like, she gave everyone the gift of astronomy. Uh, uh yeah, there's a lot of things where they're, they're trying to pile a whole lot of importance on this one lady who was, is not real. <laughs> Like, or, or she fooled this dude's parents and was like, yeah, I totally made up astronomy. I just did that with my cave buddies for a hundred years. Yeah. I, yeah, I did that. Yeah, I I don't know. I yeah, don't... I met St. Augustine. Yeah, yeah, I put my head on his lap. Nothing it was, happened, though. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it does seem, again, the more interesting story here is the story behind this book. And why those, why Rebecca and Jonathan Makepeace thought that this lady was real and immortal, and that all this shit really happened. Oh, oh. Yeah, I made friends with Paul of Tarsus. He got beheaded, and I didn't help at all. Yeah, I just left him. Good luck. <laughs> oh, yeah, do you remember when... So, uh, after, like, the orgy cave was done or whatever, and she, like, sends the Magi packing, um, she... <laughs> the book says, together they shared the drink of lasting farewell, in caps, like, Capital D, L, and F, drink of lasting farewell. And I was, well, enjoy the cyanide, fellas. Yeah. <laughs> like, I legitimately thought she was just killing them all. But yeah. apparently, apparently what really happened was she got them drunk and made sure that they were drunk riding camels down this huge ass <laughs> mountain with dogs also on these camels while they're following a dog guide. <laughs> that was... That's and that's when they come out of their, like, left. stupor and, like, they, they have the amnesia. So they're just coming off of a mountain, like, super cold with, like, a bunch of dogs on their camels. And they're like, wait a minute. What the fuck happened? I just have so many questions. Like, what the fuck? I, what? Okay, I get that. Okay, a dog can totally be a guide. Absolutely. Like, if a, that's fine. Dogs can be trained to do that. But, like, 
having dogs riding camels with drunk dudes down a huge mo- snowy mountain. Like, I just... You've never had a good oh. old drunk camel d- dog nav, Paris? <laughs> no! And then, and then like, the, the Magi are like, huh, weird that our camels are still young. And I was like, yeah, what the fuck, demigod? Why the fuck do you keep the camels young but not us? Because like, yeah. <laughs> all the Magi aged, but the camels didn't. Like, <laughs> Oh, what? yeah, that's right. They were, the camels were just there the whole time in the orgy cave. A mag- that's a weird orgy. <laughs> yeah, you You're know. trying to get it down with, like, all your bros in the cave with this one immortal dog lady, and then the, the camel looks at you again. And you lose it. It's, it's all over. You gotta just stand in the corner and watch with the camel at that point. Yeah, like, you and the camel <laughs> gotta go have a drink together now. <laughs> <laughs> like, what? why'd you look at me, dude? I was next up. Oh, god damn it. Oh, well, that's fine. I mean, we're going to be here for another thousand years, right? It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> we got plenty of time. Do you want to look at these astronomy plates, or do you want to look at what's the orgy? I mean, that's the only two things that are happening around here anymore. Yeah, like, why do they never leave the cave? I don't understand this, like, <laughs> weird cave prison. Like, it... yeah. It's like, she she presents as, like, benevolent, but she does, like, trap them in there. Yeah, she does. She does trap and kind of seduce that. She reminds me of... Circe, like like Greek mythology, Circe, you know. <sighs> anyway, um, there there are other like I'm just gonna go down the list of like weird shit in this book. So all of a sudden she starts talking about how she was exiled by Djoser, the Egyptian king. Uh, you know that was around the same time as like Imhotep. That um, oh, she, was a, she was a dog breeder for, it, and I was like. Uh, dude, you left willingly on a magnificent barge that he gifted you. You weren't fucking (laughs) exiled. And she says it like three times. And I was like, dude, you weren't exiled. You left willingly. She's like, huge, magnificent barge. She's saying she has to like cover or or, like for her story or something. But like you totally, that's not a necessary lie to like fuck over Pharaoh Joser. Who's like also looking at you in the afterlife along with Alulim or in your first husband going like, dude, she's selling us out all the time. (laughs) Yeah, like I'd love to see the the collection of men up in heaven watching Earth TV, like watching all the Luki shit going on. They're all like, "Oh wow, we're all idiots." There's like a Luki watching Roman, like you know, like Augustine eventually like wanders in, finds him, he sees like the five other dudes in there, just like already, and they're like, "Yeah, come on, pull up a seat. Just you, you're gonna want to watch." <laughs> All at once, the like fifty magi walk in, and everyone yeah. in the room is like, "Son of a what the fuck? God damn it, Luke! God damn it!" And like, oh wow, this is great. Oh, do we have fifty chairs? Oh Jesus! I, how is this is heaven? How do we not have enough chairs? <laughs> we need a bigger TV. Oh come on, Jesus! Can you get us a bigger TV, please? Oh. Um, yeah, and, then and Jesus is actually super jealous that he never got to meet her because he had to die. <laughs> Jesus had to die, but Luki gets to live. Jesus is actually super mad about the oh, whole thing. Oh, yeah, yeah. Jesus is like, <laughs> the fuck, this bitch gets 8,000 years on the earth and I get 33 years. What dad, is going what on? The fuck? <laughs> fuck you, dad. And the dad's like, oh, come on, man. We all make mistakes. I like, grab the wrong lightning bolt, all right? <laughs> you know how it, they're the same color. They all look the same. Uh,. <laughs> No, like I'm just again. I'm just gonna go down my list. Um, you go. Very just... only so so a whole lot of nothing happens in this book, right? There's so there's never any tension. Uh, there's no. never like you never worry that anything bad is gonna happen to Nana or to Luki because magical shit. But you know, just just real real cash, uh, real cash. She's like, yeah, you know, I've had to murder some people, and you're like, wait, what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm sorry, excuse me. <laughs> like just she, very she, like, casually. Ruminate, like, yeah, sometimes to keep my secret, you just have to snap <laughs> someone's neck off and <laughs> like dispose of their body. But yeah, that's she, just how it goes, being immortal. She goes, she goes, oh yeah, I just had to like I totally killed a village priest without compassion because he was gonna uh, sacrifice me on an altar as a demon. So like, I killed him. And you you're just like, what, you do. what? And you're just like, okay, one, that's fine. But two, like, why didn't you write about that <laughs> in the story? I much, much would have preferred. To read uh, her being persecuted as a demon and then having to come up with a way to kill the priest and get away with it. That would have been yeah, way cool, more interesting. Cool but immortal no. dog lady adventures. But no, it's only two sentences. And then you're Yeah, like, we gotta read about cool. how depression is in the fucking cave for another thousand years instead. 
Also, that one time for like a hundred years, she was just like naked and raving and didn't speak at all. Oh, that's way later. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm also, I'm just so confused about how her magic and immortality works. Like, I, you know, she's like at one point in the book, she's already been alive for, I don't know, three or four thousand years at this point, and she's like, oh no, I have to leave this village quickly. And again, as I mentioned before, she has a cloaking ability to make people forget her, so doesn't really seem like she would need to move ever or even that often. Um, and two, don't you think if you did have to move villages a lot because you're immortal that you would kind of like have your system down after the first couple hundred years? Like, yeah, I, you know. <laughs> I feel like you would know the upper, li- like what you could push, you know, like, you, you know, probably... first I hit, you know, uh, uh, Northeast Asia, it's real cold up there. You know, you can hang out there for a while when you're depressed and sad. Then I'll take it back to Europe for a couple, fu- you know, 100 years, get some nice food over there. It's nice and temperate. Then you got to hit Africa for a while. You can stick around there for a while. Turn- <laughs> got, well, like, this whole... uh, no, I just think that, you know, it's pretty simple. I don't know how old she was when she got struck by lightning and immortalized, but probably tw- in her 20s, maybe. Because of course she's very beautiful naturally. How could how could they ever make anyone not conventionally beautiful immortal? How could they ever be the center of any story? Oh no! Exactly. Yeah, no, there's no way. Ugh. So of course she is beautiful. Although thankfully we were spared any uh, intricate details about her form. I was glad of that. This that book... was it was a little bit upfront. Like when she was doing like the period and like nursing Ugh. the puppy stuff. There was a lot of like. Her breastily breasting chat kind of thing happened. I mean, like I think first... I think all he was just like, "Oh, she was super beautiful" or something. Uh, but oh, fuck, what was I? Oh yeah, right. I was gonna say, you know, sure, if you're you know really attractive lady, you can probably be like, "Yeah, I'm still 45. I just have great genes." But then, like, as you're approaching 50, maybe like leave. Uh, you know, keep track of how long you're in a village. I don't know. You don't have to wait that long. You can just be like, oh, I gotta go uh, get some cigarettes, you guys. I'll be <laughs> back later. And then just move to the next other side of the continent. Because she has no issues just, like, walking down an entire continent shoreline. Yeah, I I don't know. And then at one point she's like, oh, I can just move to Rome. I know I've mastered many languages and I can read and write and speak in all of them. And I was like, yeah, but you don't know Latin. Like, cause at the, at that time she was still in, oh, fuck, where the hell was she? I mean, obviously Latin wasn't the only language spoken in Rome. Rome was a very cosmopolitan, uh, place. It is not as, uh, a lot of people imagine, uh, Rome and the Roman Empire to be very, uh, white, which is weird cause it was not. No, nope, <laughs> um, definitely not. <laughs> it was not. Uh, as someone who studied classics for six years, I can tell you it was not, um, a lot of people have this idea in strangely uh it's very strange but because a lot of the statues from greek and roman times are white marble it's not because people were white it's because the paint fell off because they're yeah. old so <laughs> fyi um that is why have you seen the mock-ups of like what it looked like with paint they actually look kind of stupid <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah some some of them do look kind of cartoonish but they they were really the greeks and romans were very into like garish colorful shit um but yeah i mean people people were very mixed um people from that part of the world uh are not white blonde blue eyes <laughs> like that's just not nope. i mean you know it was it was mixed so sure some people um were lighter of skin hair and eye color but many people were olive skin black brown you know not the um not as european as everyone likes to imagine that was a random rant i had to go on yeah. but um <laughs> i just like to point that out because a lot of people don't realize it but there uh let's see on my list of weird shit the author makes a couple of claims that the dog Nana can outrun horses. Oh, yeah, you know. And can also run faster than any man in a sprint or marathon. And I just don't think that that's true. I think I mean, that... I mean, the, the man, sure. A dog can definitely outrun a dude. I think a dog can outrun a dude in a sprint. Um, Easily in a sprint. But a marathon? Uh, well, yeah, yeah, I guess sight- prob- yeah, sighthounds were specifically um, 
bred to be able to hunt over difficult terrain for long periods, so maybe. But like, not a horse a though. Horse? Like, I don't know about that. That seemed a little specious. But I'm not a I'm not a horse expert, so I don't know. <laughs> there was, anything there was anything a... else on your stupid list? Yeah, I mean, there are, um, so something that I thought about a lot as I was reading this book was the mind connection between Nana and Luki. So, I don't know if they can shut that shit off, but, like, I hope so, because Nana had a lot of dog sex over that 7,000 yep. years, and I yep. really hope that Luki wasn't, like, tuned in for all of that, because that's weird as hell. Yeah. Um, and it was something that I wondered about because it did seem like they would, they could intrude on each other's thoughts whenever they wanted to. Like it wasn't a, um, you, you know, like the this telepathy was not a was not a um, what is what is that called when you need, uh, uh yeah, it, like it wasn't a two party consent state. Like it was only a yeah. one party <laughs> consent. So like. Yeah. Uh, which yeah w- w- seems like it would be weird for a lot of things because I have a lot of thoughts in my head that do not need to go outside my head for any reason imagine like, that after 7,000 years of existing with the kind of thoughts you're having yep uh, th- let's see there was another time where and you're also mind bonded to your p- immortal partner who's existed for 7,000 years and you can e- hear each other's thoughts uh, also that immortal partner is a dog <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> Turns out for 7,000 years, it's just, hey, treat? Just treat? Oh, my God. You got a treat? Dude, this would have been so much funnier if it was just like... <sighs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's the thought. Like, just... 7,000 years of just, like, like treats? Wh- wh- where's that milk phone? <laughs> treats. <laughs> squirrel, 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 squirrel. Squirrel. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> It's just, just like the stupid dog thoughts, not, not yeah. like this like ev- elevated dog. That would have been fucking hilarious. Yes. Um, there's some other shit. So when, uh, Luki was living in Tarsus, when she was living in within the Roman Empire, she was attending a prestigious university, and people, there was some guy who was like her, I don't know, her like main enemy or whatever and and her academic would, rival yeah they would always argue during class and then she became wicked famous and he was mad about us so he was like she's immortal he just like deducted <laughs> it evil somehow yeah i have no idea how he figured it out and then she convinces everyone at during this big speech at like their commencement their like grad college graduation in ancient rome and yeah, you know. and at the end da, of her speech da, 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 da. and at the end of her speech she slits her left forearm from wrist to elbow yeah. as like the dramatic ending to her speech and i was like what <laughs> and I, that proves her as not immortal because she doesn't die because she from... bleeds that was the whole thing it was like oh she showed them that she had blood so like she couldn't be immortal and i was like that makes no fucking sense like what <laughs> everyone knows immortals don't have blood <laughs> what? that's why vampires need it so much oh yeah I fa- oh that's right this is this is also why she like faked her death and caused that like that fire and, yeah. and, and um, i made a note because like i said i i thought she had set up some kind of like rude goldberg machine to create the fire but no you know what she did <laughs> i made a note lol let me just leave this wicked dangerous task to my maid and save myself yeah <laughs> she just had her maid she goes she goes look uh the rest of us are gonna leave can you just light the flame to my reading lamp by my bedside and then knock it over and then like run real fast and watch your skirts <laughs> yeah just, just watch them you know oh man and then at some point she's um she's worrying that she's gonna end her final days in poverty and begging, but she earlier talked about how she had lived as a as a poor person in a various different places to disguise her identity before. So I'm like, you're already like four thousand years old. Who can like why is this also, something you care about? Like all of a sudden? I don't know if she really has to eat, and you've already been in caves for thousands of years. It's like, what what are you begging for? You know how to be fine, yeah. Without, yeah, like the interest on those on those savings accounts she has at these banks across <laughs> a- the ancient world. I mean, she's gonna be incredibly wealthy. I, um, there's uh, more dumb notes. 
She talks about how she gives the she feeds her dog goat's milk, dates, and wild grains, and I was like, can dogs even eat this? I I mean, they can eat gra- some they can eat some grains, but they can totally eat rice. They can, yeah, but I don't know about dates though and goat's milk. That doesn't sound like a thing a dog should have. I don't know. Yeah, goat's milk uh, might be funky. Uh, she, she's like, there's the part where she's complaining. She's like, why must I live a life of one continuous conversion after another? And I was like, yo, dude, you're immortal. Do whatever. Like, like you can yeah, literally like, do you don't whatever. Have to, like, you literally don't have to answer to anyone. Yeah, I. I uh, oh and Chris, you made an excellent note where she's trying to give words of encouragement to one of her maids, and she talks about like, oh, you're gonna be so great, you're gonna be like, you're gonna succeed in life. Don't worry, you're gonna have a dozen children, and and your note was thousands of years of existence, and this is how you view your gender. <laughs> Yeah, it's just, like, she's just still like, have a lot of babies. And Be also, a mom. Also, this woman, the woman who went to prestigious universities and knows all kinds of shit about, like, medicine and philosophy and astronomy, she's like, she t- she tells her fucking uh, servants, like, oh, don't worry, you'll you'll have some babies. Like, why are you not educating them along with you? Why are you not bettering the women in your life? Why? Ugh. <laughs> All right, Paris. Uh, I mean, I've, I've had nothing to say else about this book for quite a bit. Oh, and She's then like, her other mate. No, no, no. I, I got a whole. Oh, don't you oh, worry. Oh, my God. Let's um, just keep, keep them coming. I'm just going to so, so one of Luki's servants died in that fire that she intentionally caused to try to fake her own death. Um, And the other one who lived the, through the fire thing uh, dies of the dumbest reason. And I don't understand why Luki couldn't just cure her. Um, She, like stepped on a nail and died of tetanus slowly yeah. <laughs> like fucking what? nail got her man so, I, sometimes just... you know even if you you have an immortal mistress that has has like all the healing knowledge she died because it was to make the point that luki can't cure everything she has thousands of years of knowledge but oh fucking nail to the foot <laughs> sorry shouldn't have stepped there yeah um and so this book seems like it seems like the author did some googling about various points in history because you know get some places right and some times right and things like that which okay great i'll take it um but for some reason whenever he talks about luki having uh, a sword he says the short roman blade she carried for protection and i was like bro it's a fucking gladius just fucking, you know it's a Gladius. You yeah, know I'm it is. Sure, that, that I was got in your research. Like, somewhere. like several times in the book, he, he the short Roman blade. She, oh my god, it's a fucking Gladius for the love of God. And um, that, that was my that was my note. It's called a fucking Gladius. Um, Favorite book club. It's a fucking Gladius. Yeah, Come on. Sorry, sorry. God too, damn. It. Too many years of classics. Um. Six long years. Um, and and so the kind of the the climax of the action. I mean, not that you'd notice while reading it, but I think intended <laughs> to be the climax of action in the first. It's book. one of those ones that you're just like, did did you finish? Did you finish? <laughs> uh, there's this weird part where, um, Luki thinks about killing herself, and. Nana stops her, but in a very bizarre way. Um, Chris, I don't know if you remember this part. I don't remember it super clearly enough to probably sell it the right way that it should. But I do remember being like, "What? Wait, what? Why did that? Why is that the way?" Also, we have we have been talking for an hour and a half, and we haven't read anything from the book, so I should do that. Uh, <laughs> did you have the passage about this in front of you? I or? do. I do. Um. I'll, I'll read this. Luki rummaged through her bag for the short Roman blade she carried for protection. <laughs> it's a fucking it's a gladius. Fucking gladius. <laughs> she held it up to her eyes and stared at it with frightful emptiness. She turned to Nana with watery eyes and cupped her muzzle with a free hand. Nana, dear, what am I to do? What am I to do? When Luki touched her, Nana felt a dullness in the light of their bond. Luki's thoughts were disordered, not at all of the usual kind, and her words were strange with meanings that Nana did not fully understand. If there was one thing that Nana feared in life, it was the loss of her bond with Luki. 
Even in their cave home at the height of Luki's depression, it was not like this. Only once had Nana experienced a likeness to the dullness she now felt. The sense of her impending doom in the desert when she was a puppy. She could see the dullness expressed in Luki's black, purposeless eyes. For the first time since they left their cave home, she was truly afraid. The desert sands forged Nana. The desert sands gave her permanence. She knew what to do. Whatever mother was planning, it was not going to happen on her watch. She leaped at Luki, paws flying and grasping at Luki's arms, which caused Luki to fall back and lose her grip on the sword. Nana mounted Luki and moved her muzzle close to Luki's eyes. She viciously growled, as if she had captured a wild animal and was about to break its neck, and she allowed the spittle from her muzzle to drop down on Luki's face, a sign that she was ready to carry out her desires. For the first time in their long existence, Luki was afraid that Nana turned into an untamed wolf, and there was pure terror in her eyes. If I have to, mother, I will mangle your fingers and toes. Henceforth you will limp and grasp things with your knuckles, and you will beg me to hunt your daily rations. You will eat the remains of wild animals like a wild animal and lick their blood to quench your thirst. You will live nothing more, nothing less. Luki looked into Nana's mind, hoping to sway her mind. Nana growled the more, teeth ready to slice into Luki's face. Do you forget? I am like you. Do not shift me. Do not test me. Yeah, so Nana just, like, basically threatens to Metallica's one her if she I... actually kills her, tries to kill herself or something. Like, also, did, I think that that passage was actually a really good um, kind of nugget uh, to show you what all the writing in this book is like. It's it's there, but it's not good. <laughs> a lot of, a lot of uh, repeated words uh, sort of in the same sentence or within the same couple of sentences. It's sort of not not really the way i don't know i mean that was mostly a dog speaking so i guess i'm not really sure how a dog <laughs> yeah, would knows? speak but it seems i can't remember anything also i don't my dog bit off my <laughs> fingers and toes <laughs> uh wish i knew what this sword was called <laughs> i really should be because i'm fucking old <laughs> Take this sword away from me. Bite my toes and then my fingers too. <laughs> oh no, not my face as well. <laughs> oh no. Oh, that was uh, cool. Um, but um, this passage also confuses me. I, I made a note saying it was weird and creepy because, like, if somebody wants to kill themselves and then you just threaten to also kill them, I. I don't know no, how just that deters them. Just maim. Yeah, I mean, it does say maim, but... Nah, <laughs> it doesn't... It doesn't... Yeah, not a really great, like, therapy strategy. I have a girlfriend who's a social worker, and I don't think she would uh, back that as a, as a viable way Also, to... yeah, also, like... If I... Are, okay, if I already don't want to live as kind of an average you know, everyday person, why would I want to live more if you fucking mangle me? Like, no, if anything, I would yearn for death even more. Like, you're you're not helping the situation here. I, I don't get it. You think your life's so shitty? I'll make it shitty. Oh, and then here's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it's like, okay, great, I'm just gonna want to kill myself more. Sweet, thanks. Um, and then, so that's the end of a chapter. Um, and let me, I'm just gonna read a little bit of the next chapter, so because this is what we were talking about, b about before, where all of a sudden, something different is happening. Uh-huh. Uh, chapter 8, To Live Alone. Luki Galanzu loved the sea. She sat high in the bow of the merchant ship and let the light breezes and sea sprays gently embrace her, which tempered the harsh sun rays that reddened her shoulders and arms. She surveyed the distant shoreline in front of Hippo, her destination, and the home of her dearest friend, the famous Christian philosopher-priest Augustine. She looked That's forward a... <laughs> to sitting under the aging shepherd's shade trees, cooling her legs up to her knees in a large pail of brine and leisurely sipping his delightful pomegranate wine. Luki looked down at Nana. Only a few leagues distant, Nana dear, and we shall learn what we learn. What? You know. I Okay, first of all, I didn't know that, like, the the hot new, uh, the hot new, like, beauty treatment was sticking your legs in pails of brine. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, no. <laughs> just gotta get those legs nice and tasty. Nice. Yeah. And also later when you need a snack, just, you know, lean down. <laughs> yeah, just cut off. on it a little. Like, <laughs> cut off a slice of your leg. Delicious. Yeah. No, um, just, no, don't have to cut it off. Just kind of gum it a little, you know. Uh, oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah, just chew it a little bit. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, I don't know what that's about. I mean, salt is an exfoliant, but it's like really harsh. Uh, you know. I... Hey, when you're immortal, you gotta you gotta really go for it if you want to feel anything. Oh, that's true because like if you're immortal, your um your old layers of dead skin probably isn't sloughing off. So you, yeah, you gotta actually yeah, you're right. You know what? You gotta use like those hard exfoliants like salt and sand and really <laughs> fucking rip that dead skin off of you. <laughs> the new immortal soap for you. It's sand and sandpaper. For your legs, get that skin that's been on you for hundreds of years off today. Actually, it's just a sanding bench. Just, just yeah, yeah, get on there. It's just a belt sander, actually. Yeah, just a belt sander. Power will be invented uh, in 500 years, so, you know, uh, just wait a little. You know, this is an investment. If you call <laughs> right now. Are you immortal? Do you have the same skin? <laughs> actually, no. This whole line of joking does. I'm sorry. I got us here, and I need to apologize. That doesn't make any sense. If she's not aging, then her, of course, her skin isn't dying, right? Like, yeah, she's not yeah. changing. Sorry, I fucked that up. But that was funny, <laughs> uh, if you suspend your disbelief shortly. But, oh, that's right. Wait, the next paragraph is why I thought that she and Augustine were boning. Uh, the peaceful sea excursions back and forth from Carthage and Augustine's unique blend of humor and philosophy always rejuvenated her. Admittedly, he sometimes went overboard in his fervor, but she never minded too much. She's prayed especially hard for August, as she warmly called the venerable prelate, to provide her with a miracle explanation this trip. She needed his help in a special way. That whole paragraph made me think like, oh, all right, they're like together, but no! (laughs) Oh, what a book, Paris. I I just... I think we were like, honestly, this has been going so long now. (laughs) I know. Oh, I don't Dark even cave remember. Dark imprisoning me. All that I see. <laughs> see all of these orgy. mad guys. I cannot <laughs> live. I cannot die. Trapped in a cave. Body with nothing but myself. Nana has taken my sight. She's taken my speech. She's taken my hearing. Okay, I'm done. <laughs> oh. Oh, I don't even know what to say anymore. I don't. Okay. Conclusion. Don't fucking read this book. No, please. don't even go into the other parts because I stopped. No, it only gets worse from here. Uh, it's real bad. Oh, all right. I think the only part we didn't get into deeply was when she came to America. Uh, and we, we there was a, I mean there was more of the same stuff. Her talking to some of the, of the tribal groups around there, and they oh, yeah, thought and she was she... a wise woman, and she bred dogs for them, and then she left. Oh no! And then she had she did have that period where she, like you mentioned briefly earlier, where she was naked and quote wild in the woods and was just like eating raw deer and stuff and growling at people. Yep, you know, <sighs> gotta mix it up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh... All right. Well, Paris, how about we take you know thank you to the many people that support Tower Book Club as well as the person that recommended this to us, Elisa. Yeah, thanks, Elisa. Uh, thanks, and thank you for your eternal patience. Um, and if you would like us to read something but not wait one or two years for us to do so, you can join our group of Patreon supporters at the $5 or more a month tier. Actually, I said that in the wrong way. At the $5 a month tier or higher, you can choose a book we read once per year and we'll read it immediately if you so desire. Uh, currently, those who have the direct power to guide our hands include Dari, Greg, Will, Veronica, D, Jared, Lynn, and Sina. Thank you all very, very much for your support. Um, Thank you very much. Yeah, and uh, speaking of those patrons at the $5 tier or more, they will all soon be able to enjoy the first episode of Terriblo's Torture, a special video segment. Uh, we recorded it last weekend, and Chris is hard at work editing. I think he's actually almost done. I, I made something... Uh, just mwah, exquisitely stupid, <laughs> I think, Paris. Uh, yeah, um, so it's going to be up on the Patreon by the end of March, but maybe sooner um, for all of you who are at the $5 or more tier to enjoy. Um, yeah, it's got a it's got a particular uh, flavor that... You know, we're, we're still gonna... getting we're just... our production legs in the video form, but like I think I, I, rolled, with, I rolled into it quite well. Yeah, um, we're going to say that it was all intentional, and we'll leave it at that. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so uh as of right now we are only seven dollars away from our next patreon goal so if you want to give us easier access to books get some maybe tbc bookmarks in production and watch that new video you can head over to patreon.com slash join slash terrible book club and become a patron um you can also enjoy other types of extra content um including tracks of me and chris watching movies or tv show companions to books we've read on the podcast uh the latest is the super mario brothers movie <laughs> that was a good one yeah that other was... content includes a full season of legend of the seeker that, that's basically what we did last year and yeah boy, we, oh boy. <laughs> it took fucking forever um yeah there is there's actually i was i was looking at the patreon and i was like wow there's a lot of content on here for for five dollar or more patrons so uh if you're looking for more of more of us talking there is a lot of it um yeah uh i guess as one of a kind of a minor note if um if you don't have a podcast like app of choice or if you are open to checking out a new one do us a favor download the radio public app and listen to us on there because if you do that it helps us passively generate income for the show um, every play on Radio Public gets us two cents and an extra dollar bonus if you listen to three episodes in a row. So um, I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but that is a hell of a lot more than anywhere oh, yeah. else offers. Um, I think at this point, only Spotify offers anything and even what they offer is trash. It's like point oh 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 one cent <laughs> yeah. um, per play. So two cents per play plus the dollar bonus for um, three excuse me back to back listens is actually um a pretty good source Quite of income wonderful. For the... yeah a it's really nice deal. it's pretty great uh radio public also helped us make our website so uh we're big fans of them and um if you would consider it we uh we hope that you will download the app download the app and listen to us on there because that would uh help us a little bit uh we also love when people say hi and interact with us so please reach out to us on twitter instagram goodreads or facebook you can also send emails to us at terriblebookclub at gmail.com and if you haven't done so, uh, go ahead and review the show. Um, I mean, you can do it on iTunes. You can do it somewhere else, like on whatever podcast app of choice you have. Or I don't know. There are just there open your way... window and scream about how much you like <laughs> the podcast. Yeah, actually. you know what? You know what? Put on a tri-cornered hat, get a bell, and start just <laughs> crying just about claiming it everywhere you go. Book club, <laughs> oh, book. God. <laughs> it's my terrible books club and i need it now <laughs> are you an immortal being do you need yeah. entertainment no oh wow even immortal beings need some curation of the kind of books they read paris that's true oh god yeah actually probably more so than the average person because i mean i feel like there are too many books now in the present day imagine if you're a mortal being oh man it's like it's too much too many scrolls Exactly. You know, mm. we're here. Check out Terrible Scroll Club. <laughs> <laughs> Terrible, Our prequel. Terrible Scroll Club. <laughs> oh, fuck. That, that, that was our influence way back from uh, Ancient Sumer. No, that was actually Terrible Clay Tablet Club, which is a lot harder to find copies of nowadays. Yeah, no, Terrible Scroll Club. Um, <laughs> You see, that was founded in Alexandria, but that shit fucking burned down, so... Yeah. It you was know. a horrible podcasting fire that <laughs> they tried to do the first podcast in the world ever, ever in, in the history, and the whole library went up. So. Yeah, they, I mean, they had strings and shells for miles just <laughs> yeah. trying to get the sh shit on the airwaves. <laughs> oh, God. All right. This episode is too long, and I yeah, hate wow. it. Yeah, wow. I hated I it. Can't I can't believe we went this long. <laughs> I hate it. There was just too much. I just had, like, a list of things. There was nothing of substance to talk about. I just had a list. It was <laughs> terrible. Yet we... Yeah, it's an hour and, like, 30 minutes. <laughs> Fucking, no, it's, like, two hours. Oh, wow. All right. We better get out of here then, Paris. Oh, uh, all right. We, Thanks. Unless, you, unless you're immortal, this is too long. Oh, no, you've discovered my secret. <laughs> oh, no, no. You're going to have to just cast me into the fire just without remorse. Yeah, what you, what'd you think what'd you think happened to Terrible Scroll Club? Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> And with that, we leave you. All right, uh, bye, Paris. <laughs> <laughs>